I'm taking this vitamin C drip and my hip had been hurting and I got up out of the chair after the vitamin C drip, my hip wasn't hurting me anymore. And I tested positive for black mold, Lyme disease, mercury poisoning. Perfect storm. In this book, he said at one point, the toxins in your mouth, he would attribute to greater than 95% of heart disease. And so that comes from your mouth. And he went on to say, I'd say it's more than 99%, but I can't prove it. That's a very high percentage, almost 100%. Yeah. Link to the mouth. Practice of dentistry treats the mouth as if it's not connected to the rest of the body, which is just an absurd thought. That was the only thing you changed at that time. That was the only thing I changed. You mouth taped and you went from zero to four minutes of total deep sleep, which is really bad, to 45 minutes to 60 minutes of deep sleep. Yeah. Wow. I don't know how we got so wrongheaded on understanding nutrition and prescribing nutritional guidance as a matter of public health. But I think the science is becoming increasingly clear that we've gotten it wrong. You know, medical costs are just rising and rising and rising. And we have a fairly deep understanding of why that's happening, right? It's standard American diet, processed foods. It's all these other things that people are unwittingly, and I unwittingly for many years, was a consumer of. Admiral Doug Fierce, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast in person here in Miami. Thanks for making the trip, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Thanks for having me. I love this guy. Um, you're going to hear the backstory on how we met. You are just uh, an amazing human being. And for those listening and watching, you've got quite the story you're going to hear right about now. So, Doug, how? <laughs> let's get back to your backstory. What did you do for a living for such a long time? And what were some of the health challenges that started, health challenges that started to occur throughout your career? Yeah, so I, um, I grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland on the Chesapeake Bay. And so I grew up around the water my whole life and uh, I just loved all activities on the water. And so when it came time for me to pick a vocation, the Coast Guard seemed like a pretty logical choice for me. So I, um, I enlisted in the Coast Guard back in 1982 um, with no intention of staying past four years. And, uh, and 40 years later, I retired, which I think just illustrates that I'm a terrible planner. <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I, um, I fell in love with going to sea, and it gave me a purpose. And then later, uh, as I progressed professionally in my Coast Guard career, um, I, we started to come back to Washington, D.C., and I would do these different jobs in like the House of Representatives or in the Office of Budget and Programs or dealing with the Office of Management and Budget and the federal budgeting process. Uh, and then ultimately worked on the National Security Council staff a couple of times for a couple of different presidents. And so while I didn't set out to, to really be a policy or a, a DC figure, um, I kind of ended up being one by default just by virtue of having come back so many times and um, and just persistently in the space, learning the craft like any profession. And so, um, yeah, so I, but I, I spent um, almost a dozen years at sea and, wow. and I served in eight different ships, served in two Navy ships, did an exchange tour with the Navy back during Desert Storm. And so uh, spent a little time over in the Arabian Gulf during the Gulf War. And, um, but just, I, I just, fell in love and just was very comfortable in a shipboard environment. So I continued to do that through my career. Um, but somewhere, and, and, and this is a little bit like boiling the frog, right? You don't really know exactly when the water starts to get warm, but at some point you recognize that it's too hot. And at some point in my experience, I just started to hit the wall. And um, I couldn't put my finger on it. I had brain fog. I had uh, fatigue in my body. I had pain in my hips and my low back. Um, and it's easy to just dismiss that and go, eh, I'm getting old, you know? And, and so not as active as I had uh, used to be. And, and I think when you, when you layer that on top of the responsibilities of being married and being a father, uh, and having professional obligations and being in a work environment that many times demanded, you know, 14, 16, 18 hour days, um, you know, six, seven days in a row, you just kind of stop taking care of yourself. And I don't know that I recognized that that had fully happened to me, but I woke up one day and I'm like, I'm a mess and I don't know how I got here and I don't know how to get out. And so before we get too much further into the story, um, I know you always like to end with the gratitude at the, uh, your vitamin G at the end. 
But I want to tell you how grateful I am for you, uh, for Mindy Pels, for John Lawrence, for Dan Pompa, all of whom I've gotten to know. Um, but I, I, in desperation one night, I was sitting in our home in Washington, D.C. We lived on Capitol Hill. And I sat out in front of YouTube, and I don't know what prompted me, but I, I started searching around on YouTube, and I came across Mindy Pels. And she was giving a, a lesson on um, the different stages of fasting. And I was intrigued by that. And then she gets to this concept of autophagy. And I was fascinated by autophagy. And I was just completely taken with this idea that this is what your body does in a fasted state. And so I started to try it. And um, at first, it was nice because I lost weight and I needed to lose weight. Uh, but then more importantly, I discovered over time the importance of the cellular healing and the cellular recycling process. And I've shared this with my brother, who's a, who's a professor at a university. He's a biology professor. And while the autophagy is what grabbed me, um, all the discussion and debate around insulin resistance is what grabbed him. Mm. And so I think we all have these different stories and these different things that make our ears perk up to go, this is really compelling. And so I started down this road, um, started out watching YouTube videos, mostly Mindy. And then I started out with podcasts, uh, and that's when I found you. And I had some degeneration in my right hip uh, at the time as well that I was struggling with. And in one of your podcasts, you visited John Lawrence's clinic in uh, Sarasota, Florida. And I was stationed at Key West at the time, and I thought, it's only eight hours away. Might as well, might as well go. And so I've been to John's clinic now, probably eight or nine times. Um, and like you consider him a close friend now. Mm -hmm. So it's just all part of the journey. But, um, I started reading books on cellular healing, metabolic healing, metabolic dysfunction, uh, all the things. And, uh, I think I told you right before we started the show, I, I'm, I'm a little over a hundred books at this point. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm reading uh, Dr. Perlmutter's book, uh, Drop Acid, right now about uh, uric acid. But it's, I just, I learn something every time I take another foray into this. And so whether it's cellular healing and becoming metabolically flexible, which has been one part of my focus, whether it's restoring the degeneration in my right hip, which was another part of my focus, uh, the idea of eating cleanly, and then biohacking. And I've become, as you know, just a little bit of a biohacking mm -hmm. nerd. So um, all these things in aggregate are just making me feel better. But I, I'm 59. I was 55 when this started. Um, when I started on this journey, I feel 300% better than I do wow. four, almost four years ago. Not quite four years into this journey. Um, but it works. And like, it works exclamation point. It really does. And you know, just having the persistence to continue to see those things through. And then you make tweaks as you learn more. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So the wonderful story. I love that. I want to unpack it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your heaviest weight and uh, how much do you weigh now? So my heavy, I, I, right now I weigh about 172 pounds. Um, I'd say my ideal weight's between 170 and 175. Um, I was 207 pounds mm -hmm. at my heaviest. Uh, and you saw the presentation I did in Sarasota. I actually have a photo of me, a professional photo of me in uniform um, at about 165 pounds. Mm -hmm. And then the one that I had taken three years before, I was at about 205 pounds. And you could see the, you know, the weight in my, in my neck. Um, I was just uncomfortable. And so, um, yeah, so I, 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 and like a lot of people that start fasting, I think I overused that tool initially. Happens all the time. And I got down to 157 pounds yeah. uh, on my swing down. But I, wow. went for, I went from 205 to 157 probably in four or five months' time. Wow. What, what, what sort of fasting did you do? What, what, what were your go-to schedules? Uh, mostly intermittent fasting, and then I would try to throw a 24-hour fast in once every other week. Mm -hmm. And um, once, I, once I figured out, not that I figured it out, once I demonstrated to myself that this works and this is for keeps, mm -hmm. I started throwing my clothes away. 
Mm. And so no going back. No, I just like, I'm not, I'm not wearing that size again. Great. And I just started throwing in nice clothes and, um, even, even to the point where I knew I was getting close to the end of my career in the coast guard, I bought all new uniforms about two years before I retired and nobody does that. Right. <laughs> like I can't, I can't look slovenly in, in uh, these uniforms that no longer fit me. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got rid of them. I just threw them away and, and got new ones. And so the, the great news is for anybody that's listening, um, if my story rhymes with yours, um, it's for keeps. It, it really, this stuff works. The science is clear, I think. Um, and I, I don't have any concern. The only weight that I think I've put back on, I, so at first I didn't focus as much on uh, maintaining muscle mass. Uh, but then when you figure out that as you, as you get into a state of autophagy and a fasted state for an extended period of time, you get growth hormone and these other things. And so, um, I started working my way back up with, uh, body weight exercises, burpees, pushups, flutter kicks, um, those sorts of things. Um, got a couple of artificial intelligence, uh, sort of tools that, that helped me out. The Carol bicycle. Yeah. Uh, great. If you're familiar with Carol, I love Carol. <laughs> yeah. And in, in like a 12 minute, it's 10 to 12 minute workout, you get like what they call a rehit exercise, which is reduced exertion, high intensity interval training. Um, and so you, you maximize that. I've got some other hacks too that I use. What about keto? What role did a keto play? Um, you know, so you were the one that introduced me to the ketogenic approach and, um, and so I, it took me a little while to get my head around this idea that I needed to become fat adapted first. So I focused on that. And then I immediately got focused on becoming keto adapted. Um, and so I, I prefer the ketogenic approach. It, it works for me. I think I had a lot of stuff to clean up. So I think that it's, um, uh, you know, I've read in many places that the ketogenic diet is very useful for people with cancer and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And I'm sure we all have some amount of cancer in our body. And so... A lot of that's just cleaned me up, but I, I, I think my wife and I first got our keto mojo, which we heard about uh, on the podcast, and I started testing ketones. Um, they were through the roof. Yeah, you were I, texting me some I, photos of them. I yeah, remember. I, I was, I, I was. I know you're not supposed to, so don't don't judge me too harshly. But uh, you know, I think it's the guy in me. It's like if that's the number, I need a higher number, <laughs> and so. Um, but I started a three day fast with Kate one time when you and I were texting back and forth and Kate wanted to do this fast in this particular time window. And I said, yeah, honey, I'm all in. Uh, and so, um, I wasn't 12 hours into the fast and I, I checked my ketones levels and it just said hi. And I think that, I think it's around 8.0, um, milligrams per deciliter when, said, when it shows that yeah and so I, I texted you and i was like should i break my fast and you're like yeah you probably ought to yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's ex, that's very because you don't know what level it is when it says high that's it could right. have been nine it could have been 11 it's really only dangerous when it goes around 15 that's when you reach ketoacidosis range now ketoacidosis is really rare if you're uh, not a type 1 diabetic yeah. but i mean it's a possibility right yeah. so that's yeah. why i told you to break the fast because we don't know what high is is it seven is it ten uh, yeah. Well, and, and, and so we, we had tried to do a couple of those things and I was also informed by, uh, I know you've had Dr. Bosworth on here a couple of times. Yes. I read Dr. Boz's keto continuum book yeah. and she was sitting right where you are just yeah. a couple months ago. <laughs> yeah. And so she distinguishes, and I can't remember exactly how many levels, I think she has around 12 levels of in the keto continuum and the maintenance in the middle is kind of where I was hanging out and I had gotten on bulletproof coffee and so I had my ghee and MCT oil and I'd whiz that into my coffee in the morning. And so I was doing this every day. And then, and then she distinguished in her keto continuum, having, um, a supplement like that, you know, whether it's calories from butter, ghee, uh, MCT oil, and then also being in ketosis, but not having those things. And so about makes sense. two months ago, I stopped doing bulletproof coffee and I do it episodically now. And what did you notice with the numbers? And so my ketones came down. Yeah. makes sense. Um, I didn't check this morning cause I left the house at about four 30, but, um, yesterday morning, my ketones were like 1.6, 1.7. And that was after maybe two cups of coffee in the morning. Yeah. 
but I intermittently fast most days. And so I, I find that because I'm fat adapted and I'm keto adapted, I get into it very quickly. Yeah, you do. And, and, and I think it is important to distinguish what you just said, fat adaptation versus keto adaptation. I don't think everybody understands that because it's very easy to get fat adapted. I mean, the average person could probably do it in seven days, 14 days. You're just restricting your carbs and you're adding more fat. You verify that by testing your keto mojo, your beta hydroxybutyrate, 0.5 or higher millimoles. You're fat adapted if you're there for a few days. Mm -hmm. Keto adaptation takes a little bit longer. It's the reshaping of these physiological properties and processes. So that's when now the mitochondria become primed to use ketones as this signaling molecule. Mm -hmm. So typically when you get keto adapted, the ketones actually decline on the test, but that's a good thing because it means you're sucking them up and using them. Yes. So that's what we want. Now, there are exceptions to that. You do a longer fast, of course, the ketones will go, will go up. But with an intermittent fast, once you're keto adapted, you're going to notice those ketones drop a bit, unless you're having some of those fat fasts. But that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I've, I've tried to use them as tools. I, I, I'm on the journey. You know, yeah. I, I don't know that the finish line's in sight. Yeah. And, um, but I continue, to, I continue to fiddle with it. I, I do try um, to make sure that I have a good solid feasting day. Yeah, smart. Uh, at least once or twice a week, and so I'm I'm not as I'm not as rigid now as I was when I first started because I'll I'll get into the day and if I don't eat until six p.m. I don't eat, um, but if I feel like eating at two p.m. I just eat, and so eating cleanly is you know part of that. But um, yeah, it's been it's been a great journey, and I and I got to tell you, I'm like completely satiated. Yeah. I never, I, I, I never feel like I need to gnaw my arm off, you know. Have you done carnivore yet? I'm sorry? Have you done carnivore? I haven't done carnivore okay. yet. We'll yeah. talk about that at dinner. We're going to yeah. get some steaks next. <laughs> so um, how, how has your health improvement impacted your relationship with your wife, Kate, and your two, two, two kids, your two sons? Yeah, it's, um, I've, I've been more active. So about the time all this started, we were moving from Washington, D.C. to Key West, uh, in a permanent change of duty station. And I did something during the move and I, I think it was a lifting related thing, but I just started to limp and it was in my right hip. I had degeneration in there. I knew that. Um, and I just, I like, wasn't active. I couldn't be active. Uh, in fact, we had a basketball court near a house and I've shared with you before. I love playing basketball Same. and um, and I had this vision of getting out there and shooting hoops with my boys and I just couldn't move around the court. Uh, I've got a pickup truck and when I would wash it, I would literally have to step up on the side of the truck and move very gingerly, mm. uh, to make sure that everything was, uh, functioning properly. And so as I started to lose weight and to clean everything up, and then you couple that with the rejuvenative medicine that I was doing with John Laurence. Um, I, st I started to regain my ability to, to feel like I was resilient because I felt like I was fragile initially. Um, and that wasn't, that wasn't because of the fasting. It was because of all the other things that I had, I had um, allowed to languish in my, in my own personal fitness uh, regimen. But now I, I do stuff. Um, one, of the, one of the hacks I use is a thing called a power plate. Are you familiar mm -hmm. with that? Yeah, I love it. So I've got a power plate, and um, every morning I do burpees and push-ups and planks and flutter kicks and um, squats and all of these things. So the power plate, the vibration technology in the, in the power plate and other devices like it, um, it actually increases bone density. And you had me at hello with that. I'm like, this <laughs> That's is, your this, major the, thing right this there. This is brilliant. And it, the lymphatic flow. Yes. Yep. And so, uh, so that's really good. But yeah, I've, I've done a couple things like that in the, in the biohacking arena to try to restore my health, my flexibility, how well I feel about what I'm doing. Uh, and it's worked out quite well. Have you been able to play ball? Uh, you know, I haven't been out to play ball. Okay. Maybe I should have stayed longer and we could have <laughs> gone out and shot some hoops. Yeah, that would have been great. We'll do it. Next. I love basketball too. I play every Sunday. Yeah. But that that's that's awesome. So your hip is good now. I did. Yeah. So my uh, my best friend is a big, I'll, I'll say football in respect for him, but soccer. Got uh, it. <laughs> so he's he's a he's a fo huge football fan, and he he built this pitch on his farm. Oh wow! And so he gets all these boys out there to play, and I was playing last year. Um, and I, at 58, I was the oldest guy on the field 
And uh, we've, we've got a lot of folks that, that show up from Jamaica and Central America and other places that, you know, these boys grew wow. up with a soccer ball. And so, uh, you know, I was able to hang and it, it, it was good. So I, you know, still work more work to be done, but, um, that's a good know, sign. It's, it's restoring my ability to be fully vibrant. Yes. And I'm in that I'm reminded one of the books I read recently was, uh, Peter Atia's book, uh, Dr. Atia wrote a book called outlive mm-hmm. uh, a lot of great content in that book. But one of the things that like captured my attention was this idea of the centenarian decathlon, he called it. And the idea behind that is, you know, a decathlete in the Olympic sense is probably more fit than any athlete that competes simply in one sport. Yes. Because you've got to compete in 10 different sports and, and, and have that, that level of performance. And the idea behind the centenarian decathlon is that we're all, if, if you choose to accept this challenge... Uh, we're all in this centenarian decathlon. We want to be fully functional until we die. You know, and I, I don't know whether I'll live to be 80, 90, 100, whatever it is. I just want to be fully functional and fully engaged and cognitively able to do whatever I'm required to do. And so the idea behind this is just a simple one to me. It's like you got to be working on all these fronts, yeah. uh, flexibility, stability, mobility, uh, so on and so forth, strength. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's the challenge now. Yeah. I love it. You're up for the challenge. I am too, my friend. I really am. Yeah. Hey, Keto Camper, I want to interrupt the video real quick to share with you what I believe is one of the most important nutrients that we should be taking every single day. Most people are deficient in this nutrient and it's responsible for over 400 enzymatic activities in your body and your body just doesn't make it. So it's required to be taken in a high quality supplement or from high quality foods. The problem with the food is that our soil is depleted and it's hard to get this quality nutrient. So what is this nutrient? It's called magnesium. But I'm gonna share something with you very fascinating. Check this out. Upgraded Formulas has this incredible product called Upgraded Magnesium. And Barton Scott, the developer of this product and company, he's a brilliant guy. He created nanoparticle magnesium, which has the ability to penetrate your membranes and go right into your cell. There's a 99.99 percentage absorption rate. Now, this is unheard of because with other magnesium products, you better believe it's not that high. And there's an interesting study they're doing with upgraded mag I want to share with you real quick. Early results from a sleep study with Dr. Sachin Patel showed that the average doctor in the group using this product has achieved an improvement of over 35% in deep sleep more sleep studies and a double-blind controlled placebo study with upgraded magnesium is coming sooner. And you better believe those results are going to be super exciting. We already know this. Upgraded magnesium is easily the best supplement you can take for better sleep, including deep sleep, muscle aches, cramping, and any other signs of a magnesium deficiency, which is so common, unfortunately. What makes upgraded formulas unique, as I mentioned, is that it's a nanoparticle. This means it is absorbed very rapidly and efficiently by your blood cells. They produce a plasma-like version of minerals that the body recognizes and absorbs without digestion. And the results are phenomenal. I really believe just taking this for a couple of nights, you'll notice a big difference. So if you want to get upgraded formulas, upgraded mag, and any of their products. They also do some incredible hair mineral analysis tests to see your mineral imbalances and deficiencies, et cetera, and other incredible products that we've referenced before. Head over to upgradedformulas.com and use the coupon code KETOSIS to get 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com. Coupon code is KETOSIS to get 15% off your entire order. I'm going to drop a link for you down below in the notes of this video. Okay, let's go back to this video. Part of your story was not just nutrition, although it played a big role, fasting, autophagy, keto, but you also had some environmental factors. For example, um, your silver filling. So share that journey and how you discovered that the fillings were problematic and what you did with that. Yeah, so um, let me back up and just share a little vignette. Uh, Mm Mm-hmm. So I had started to see John, Dr. John Laurence in Sarasota at, at Advanced Rejuvenation. And he had, I had been diagnosed by an ortho doc as having degenerative labrum. 
in, in my right hip. And so John was treating me for that with PRP and, and some other exosomes, uh, ultimately with V-cells. And so uh, very small embryonic like stem cells. So John started treating me with this, but he would give me these IVs of like a Myers cocktail or a vitamin C or something like that. And so if you've ever been to Key West, they have these things called hangover clinics, okay, Yes. right? And these hangover clinics are designed to help people work their way through a hangover, but, uh, but they're bona fide, you know, vitamin C and Myers cocktail, uh, IV drips. And so I, I elected to just go in and do a vitamin C drip like once every couple of weeks. And so I've, I'm taking this vitamin C drip and my hip had been hurting me that day. And I got up out of the chair after the vitamin C drip was done and my hip wasn't hurting me anymore. And so I texted him and I said, um, you know, what do you make of this? He goes, that's got nothing to do with your de degenerative labrum. You, that's the, that's a sign that you've got some toxic effect in there. So the next time I went up, he tested me for uh, a suite of different toxins and I tested positive for black mold. I tested positive for Lyme disease and I tested positive for mercury poisoning. Perfect storm. And, um, there were a couple of other lesser toxins in my body, but, um, so this got me into like, what's the mercury do? And so then I read Tom Levy's book. Dr. Tom Levy wrote a book called The Hidden Epidemic uh, in which he uh, talks about these things that are in your mouth. And so Tom Levy by trade is, is a cardiologist and he stud studied under Hal Huggins, who was one of the original uh, dentists in, bio in the biological dentistry movement. And so in this book, he said at one point, the toxins in your mouth uh, he would attribute to greater than 95% of heart disease. And so that comes from your mouth. And he, and he went on to say, I'd say it's more than 99%, but I can't prove it. Uh, but I think the data is clear enough to say that 95 plus percent of heart disease comes from your mouth. That is insane, by the way. That's a very high percentage, almost 100% yeah. linked to the mouth. Well, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's funny because you, you've heard these different conversations over time. If you listen to biological dentists being interviewed and right. read their books, but for the longest time, the, the practice of dentistry treats the mouth as if it's not connected to the rest of the body, Correct. Uh, which is just an absurd thought. Right. And so I had seven amalgam fillings in my head. And so amalgam fillings have 50 to 60% mercury in them. And so it stands to reason that that's the source of my mercury toxicity. I had one root canal disease tooth in my mouth and I had a, had a crown put on that. And that I had had that for, I think I got that in like 2008. Wow. So 2008 until just last year, uh, this thing was in my mouth. Now think about this. It's the only, it's the only procedure in all of medicine where a doctor kills the tissue in your body and then leaves it there. You wouldn't do it anywhere else. And so, um, so the tooth has to come out. And, and so I, I did that. And what's interesting is I, I got the tooth out. I went home. Uh, I, was, I was feeling pretty lethargic. And the very next morning I woke up and I had a Herxheimer's reaction from, you know, the toxins that had been released from that tooth being extracted. Yeah. You didn't take any binders or any protocol with it. I took binders and I drank ozone, wa ozonated water, and and um, did did what I could mm -hmm. chelation uh, to to try to flush that out. But I I thought I thought Kate was going to have to take me to the emergency room. Wow! And so I I just was in a in a fetal position for a better part of two hours. Wow! And so that's the extraction of one tooth. Right. Which dentist did you do that with? Was it Herman? Uh, no, I, I went. So we shared Dr. Herman in common here in Miami. He did most of my amalgam. Got it. Removal. Uh, and then when we moved, when I retired from the Coast Guard, moved back up to the Mid Atlantic, um, I uh, I started going to uh, Dr. Yu, who's up in Wilmington, Delaware, who's a wonderful guy as well. But it's it's you know going through these things very methodically. And as you and I were talking before we started the show. Uh, my one final act is I need to get the cavitations out of my, you uh, need to get the cavitations in my mouth filled. And so for those, you know, listening, the cavitations are where you would have a tooth extracted, like a wisdom tooth. Uh, when you pull the tooth out, it actually leaves a hole in your jawbone. And many times those aren't filled properly and they fill up with all different kinds of uh, bacteria and muck. 
And so um, channeling my Fletch, my inner Fletch. Uh, <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, it's muck. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a good way to put it. It looks like that. It's anaerobic bacteria that communi- yep. communicate, communicate with the gut bacteria and just create systemic inflammation. Yeah. But it's, it's like cleaning all this stuff out. Yes. And so, um, and you know, biological dentistry also looks at your airway and makes mm-hmm. sure that your airway, and my airway has gotten smaller over the years, um, due in some part probably to inflammation, but also uh, probably has something to do with these cavitations and yeah. what's leaking down my throat. And, and your diet too. Yep. Eating mushy foods and sugar and all that. Yes. So Did you ever um, have braces as a kid? I, I wore a retainer. Okay. Yeah. I did wear a retainer, but it's... Um, and I'm doing the Vivos thing like you are. Yes, the, uh, the expander. The expander. Yeah. So it's um, uh, hopefully some of these things will clear up. Yes. Clear up the airway problem. Because I did. I had, I had sleep apnea too. And I, I, uh, my wife had been telling me for years that, you know, you've got apnea. And I didn't get tested until about 2014 or 15. Mm. Uh, and I went. And I, I'll never forget the lady who, who did the sleep study on me. She wasn't a, a, a doctor. She was just the attendant for you spending the night. And she laughed at me when I came out. She goes, I'm no doctor, but you're going to be back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so your wife put it lightly when she said, I think you have sleep apnea sleep versus apnea. you're snoring every night, honey. <laughs> That's right. And I, I was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea. Severe. Course, when I lost the weight. Uh, almost all the apnea went away. Wow. I, still, I still have a little bit of it. But what I discovered too was I, I wore a CPAP uh, to help with the uh, Oxygen, airflow. Yeah. And then along the way, I bought an Aura Ring. And I was getting 100% on my CPAP score every night because I was like a good boy. I was wearing my mask and uh, doing all that. But what I discovered was I was getting zero deep sleep. Literally zero. Like not I, even one minute. I would get... Anywhere from zero to five minutes of deep sleep in a night. That is insane. And so um, I, I read Patrick McKeon's book on breathing. Yes. Uh, I read Nestor's book on breathing. Yes. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take a walk on the wild side and I'm going to start taping my mouth. And so I started to tape my mouth um, and my deep sleep just went. Order to go. Shot up to like. 45, 50, 60 minutes. That's insane. That was the only thing you changed at that time. That was the only thing I changed. You mouth taped and you went from zero to four minutes of total deep sleep, which is really bad, to 45 minutes to 60 minutes of deep sleep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, like you, you wear the aura yeah. ring. I mean, I'm always constantly trying to dial that in to improve my sleep performance. But here's something that I, um, sorry to cut you off, but yeah. on this topic of deep sleep, I started, I always experiment with deep sleep, REM sleep, HRV and all that. And I've done a lot of things to increase these numbers and get them better. My latest is an easy little biohack where I started to put on a a sleep mask, which uh, applied light pressure, which activates my vagal tone and it helped with deep and also with HRV. Oh, wow. So that might be one thing if you're not doing it already, just a light sleep mask with light pressure, you might see some numbers change. And I would be curious to see if you do see that. Yeah. I'll give that a whirl. I actually have a sleep mask in my bag here. I I, uh, since I got up so early this morning, I tried to sleep on the plane on the, plane. On the way out. <laughs> Didn't work out so well, but, um, <laughs> but no, it's so, it, and it's just like tinkering with all those different things Correct. so that you can dial in, uh, optimizing your sleep. Yeah. And that's so huge. I mean, get to get just a couple minutes of deep sleep and it's so hard to function. I, I can't even imagine. Yeah. What, well, what, what about your HRV? Uh, HRV is not super high, but, uh, but it's been higher. Um, you know, and, and I think this is one of those things where it's probably most useful not to compare yourself to too many people. Just oh, no, yeah. Compare yourself against correct. yourself. Correct. HRV is one of those things and for so sure. My yeah. HRV is probably 50% higher than it was when I first started measuring it. Awesome. Yeah, that's true. So, um, so that's good. But I, you know, while we were on the breathing topic, you know, I, I got uh, infatuated with the Wim Hof method. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I do my Wim Hof breathing most every morning. Right. Uh, try to do seven, eight, nine rounds of it. And um, there's an app for that, right? Uh, yeah. I think it's $55 a year for the Wim Hof app, something like something like that. There's also a whole bunch of like free Spotify downloads on it and yeah. YouTube too, but the app would be best for sure. Othership, I think, is another Othership really is good great. I've had the, their, their founder on, on the show a year ago. But I, so what, the way I stack my hacks in the morning, caffeine's part of it, uh, red light's part of it, right um breathing is part of it 
uh, my Carol bike ride is part of mm. it. Uh, my power plate workout is part of it. And then I also have, uh, there's a, uh, electro muscle stimulation suit made by a company called catalyst. Yeah. You told me about that. And so I've got a catalyst suit. Um, I only do that a couple times a week because it's, um, it, it takes a little while to get it set up. So mm -hmm. it's maybe 10 or 15 minutes of setup followed by a 20 minute workout. Nice. Um, but it's, it's really nice. And I just ordered the, um, generation four catsuit bands. So, uh, the, the blood flow restriction bands, blood flow restriction, uh, read something that Dr. Mercola had written about blood flow restriction. And then I, I, I don't know where I found this video, but he was at a conference somewhere and a young guy who was in his thirties, who was a clearly a gym rat, you know, said, Hey, let's arm wrestle. I saw that. <laughs> and Dr. Mercola, who I believe is in his late sixties, yeah. ended up taking this guy down. And, uh, and, and so he talked about how he was using Katsu. Yeah. And the beauty of Katsu uh, and electromuscle stimulation is for uh, a less intensive workout, you get the full benefit. And so with a Katsu workout, you might only have to work out with 30% of the weight that you would work out if you didn't. Mm. And because of the blood flow restriction, and I started with some blood flow restriction straps. Yeah. And they, they work, but they're not as good as the ones that inflate and deflate. And so what that does is it sends a signal to your brain to let you believe that you're having a high intensity interval training workout when in fact you're not. And it's all managed through blood flow restriction. So when you do all these things, it allows, you know, I'm, I'm not super old, but I'm not a, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Right. And I, I don't want to hurt myself while I'm getting stronger. And so all these things are, are meaningful ways for me to get stronger and more fit. Uh, without really endangering myself of uh, of hurting. Yeah, something. what a brilliant idea. That's a biohack if I've ever heard one, the, the cat Sue. Uh, so you're doing a lot of biohacking, yeah. <laughs> more than me, actually. <laughs> the red light, anything that you miss that you're doing these days in terms of biohacking that's uh, some of your favorite? You know, I, I um, my only limitations in biohacking, as we had talked about earlier, is my pocketbook. <laughs> yeah. um, there, there's These things get expensive pretty quickly. And... Um, I've done some things that I would love to have at my home to be able to do hyperbaric, Such as? hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, which is not inexpensive. I got to, through our event, got to meet uh, Dr. and Dr. Saunders. Yeah. Uh, Jason Melissa, and Melissa. Jason, yeah. Wonderful people. And so uh, at some point, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get to the point of having hyperbaric oxygen in the house. We spoke about the cold plunge. Cold plunge, yes. I just yes. got mine delivered right before you got here. I'll show I, it to I you. I saw the guys out. Oh, front did you see him up front? Yeah, that's great. Um, I've never done a, a a proper plunge, um, but our groundwater, because we live on a farm out on the Chesapeake Bay, our groundwater is about fifty-five degrees. Yeah, that's cold enough. And I take a fifty-five degree shower every morning as part of the Wim Hof protocol. Right, you do the breathing. Uh, I do push-ups associated with that, and then. Um, and then when I get in the shower, I enjoy my warm shower while I'm soaping up and rinsing off. And then once I'm done rinsed off, I turn the water completely cold. And I'll start it, you know, and, and I was talking about this with my acupuncturist um, up where I am at home. And she goes, how do you do it? And I said, well, I just, I let it hit me in the torso at first, the cold water. And then I let it work its way up my chest. I've had some thyroid issues, so I allow it to hit me on the neck. And most of your sensitivity is on your face. Mm -hmm. And so then I'll step into the cold shower with my face. And then the next part's always the hardest. And, I, and I've got to say, cold plunging or cold showers, um, somebody characterized it as a negotiation. Yes. Like every single time it's a negotiation because I don't get in the shower going, boy, I'm looking forward to yes. doing the cold shower. But when I turn and the cold water moves from my face around my shoulder and the back of my neck, it just sends a chill down my spine, which tells me that I'm getting it. So, yeah. um, so and I'll, I'll try to spend three minutes in a cold shower every morning. Fantastic. Yeah. But I come out after doing breathing and the exercises and all the other things, a little Superman. bit of caffeine. I am like, boom. And then ketones to boost. Mm -hmm. I mean, like my mental acuity is I, I walk out of the house some mornings just like, boom, bring it on. I love it. So, yeah. I, I mean, you've done a lot of different biohacks and there's more to come, I'm sure. <clears throat> but... Which number one biohack would you say has you've noticed the biggest difference with your energy and your health? Like which one moved the needle the most? I know you stack a lot of these, but if you were to choose one 
that you notice this is the one that has moved the needle the most in the right direction for me? Yeah, I'd like to answer that with two questions or two, two answers. Two answers. Go, go for it. Go for it. So the Wim Hof breathing mm, interesting. is probably the thing that I felt the fastest after I, I started. Tingling and energy, feeling energized. That's how I felt Com- when I first completely. did it. Completely. So yeah. you, you breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Very deep breathing. Uh, and then you get to the point where you exhale yep. and you hold your breath as long as you can. And so when I first started doing this, I could only do it for a couple seconds. Now in round one, I can typically do about two minutes. And if I do seven, a breath hold of two minutes, and if I can do seven or eight rounds, every round I can do a longer and longer breath hold. Wow. Uh, and I've, I've held my breath up to five, five, six, seven minutes. Really? Um, dude. And so, but it's, it's like, it, it really, it's a sensational feeling. It is. And then when you can couple that with the cold water, which is what his, uh, Wim Hof's prescription is, uh, it's, it's pretty magical. So that's the thing I felt the fastest Got once it. I applied it. Uh, the thing that I would not do without is red light. Mm. And, uh, over my shoulder here, you've yeah. got your red lights and I have panels just like them. Um, but I also have a portable panel Same. Yeah. and my wife and I take turns in the morning because we get up and read our Bibles and have a little quiet time in the morning. And so, um, she only uses the red light on three different areas and then she'll hand it off to me and I'm, I'll, I'll no kidding, Ben, I'll do 10 minutes, uh, on my torso. I'll do 10 minutes on my hips, uh, my glutes, which, uh, I'm trying to, um, how did my LMT put it? I had this wonderful licensed massage therapist, uh, Elsa. It was down in Key West, uh, Big Pine Key. And, um, and, and so I asked her one time, and she was working on my hip. And I said, like, what do you feel? And she goes, nothing really. He's, it's like you're completely without chi. Really? You in, know, your, in your in, glutes? In, in my glutes and my hips. And so I was a, I was a marathoner for a bunch of years. And so oh. I don't know if my running, but my hips and my glutes were in atrophy. And so I, I began to focus on those things, but I started to use red light. And so I'll, I'll actually work a red light all around mm-hmm. 10 minutes at each spot. And then I'll move it up to my uh, heart. And then I move it up to my throat. Um, and I, that's ritual for me. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't do without red light. Yeah. So. Same. I love it. I have a, I have this big panel behind you, the four panels. Mm-hmm. And then in my gym upstairs, I have a, uh, the, sa- the sauna, um, the photon beam from sauna space and a couple uh, yeah. other panels from bond charge as well. But they also have the flex, the flex beam that I strap around like my back. Yeah, I saw that. I yeah. Like that. So similar to what you're doing with the small panel, I'm doing with the flex beam where I'll put it on like my back, my knee and it just works so well. Um, yeah. and more is not better by the way. Like if you during red, red light, the way that, um, Doug just explained it 10 minutes in different areas is ideal. You don't want to spend 40 minutes in a single area. That's too much. Yep. I think 20 minutes is even uh, pushing it a little bit, but well, 10 minutes in, the, in different areas is the right sweet spot. And at the core of that, it's um, stimulating your mitochondria to produce more ATP, which gives you the energy to heal your body. Yeah. And I, I remember too, thinking back to another book, uh, Dr. Frank Schallenberger wrote a book called Bursting with Energy. I don't know if you've ever read that, but it's a... I know of it. I haven't read it. It's a fantastic book. And... At its core, you know, our bodies produce energy and that's how we live, right? And so as you get older and things stop working as well, it's because you're producing less ATP. And so, yeah. you know, as we as we look through all these different things that we're working on, like what can we do to really goose ATP production? Mm-hmm. And so my mind's been kind of there uh, as well. And so one of the other things that I, that I stack with the red light therapy is methylene blue. Mm. And so uh, Dr. John introduced me to that. Um, and so I, I would use his uh, his supplements that he would make. The suppository? The suppository. And then I would also, um, I started to uh, just buy it. You can buy it on Amazon. You, the important thing is that you get pharmaceutical grade methylene blue. Yeah. Um, but I take a couple eyedroppers full every morning. and um, And so, and I can't remember exactly uh, it's, it's in the, uh, shoot, drawn a blank on the terms of art, but, but there, there are four different channels in, in, um, the production of ATP and 
the methylene well, red light amplifies them all but when you use methylene blue and red light on top of the methylene yeah. blue uh you get more performance more atp production yeah that's the way to stack it methylene blue and then the red light or even sunshine that's another form yeah. of getting light if you want a free form which is easy to do here in miami yeah i feel great with methylene blue too you know there's a big debate these days between the nitric oxide researchers like doc i had dr nathan bryan here yes. who's a brilliant guy he's a friend of mine who he's totally against methylene blue right he thinks it's not good it depletes nitric oxide and then we have other people like john and people that i researched that love methylene blue and are against nitric oxide right yeah. so it's so interesting to see these different debates i look at them as both being beneficial however i think they're they're both they they should be used both cyclically not yes. chronically yep. Yep. so if you're going to go with nitric oxide great just use it cyclically and if you're going to go with methylene blue great just use it cyclically as well yeah and there's other ways to boost the nitrous oxide as well correct and i, and I think he's got I, i've got a nitrous oxide supplement that i take that i think is from from his company um is it no beats or uh and n101 or n101 yeah that's him the yeah. lozenge yes yeah that's a so, great product um but but there are other ways to do that and there there are a couple of other hacks that i use that that we use uh cyclically uh, like the methylene blue but ozone uh, mm -hmm. and so John had prescribed that to me as a, as a way to help with the toxicity in my body. Yeah. Smart. So whether it's rectal insufflation, ear insufflation, uh, ozonated water. Uh, and I, I told you the story earlier. Um, a doctor had tried to give me some, uh, uh antibiotics for something and I, and I simply refused to take them. Uh, and so instead I took ozonated water, yeah. which has the same, smart. same effect. Yeah. Um, you just burn through your oxygen bottle a little faster. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love it. That's the that's the route I would have chose too. Um, you mentioned that you worked with with two presidents. Uh, can you share the names or? Sure. Yeah, I, I, I worked in the George W. Bush administration, and I worked in the administration of President Trump. Um, and so uh, the way the National Security Council, I was on the National Security Council both times. Uh, the way the National Security Council works in any administration is that. People are detailed from different departments and agencies around the federal government uh, to the National Security Council staff for a one or two year stint, typically sometimes longer. Uh, brutal pace in that environment. And so I worked for President Bush um, 05 to 07, and I was the director for Central America and the Caribbean. So I owned wow. all the policy work for all the Central American company, countries in, in the Caribbean. In fact, I, on my way over, I was talking to... Uh, uh, a Haitian gentleman who was my Uber driver, Carl, Carl from uh, Capation. <laughs> I love it. And uh, we were talking all about, you know, politics in Haiti and yeah. instability and all the other things that are going on. But uh, it was a fascinating experience in my life to kind of work at that perch. And then somebody that I had worked with in the Bush administration uh, asked me to come back in the Trump administration so I was a director the first time, and then I came back as a senior director the second time. Wow. And then ultimately became the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor of the President. Wow. And so um, there's a lot going on out there, you know, and it's it's just, it's brutal work. Um, I'd like to think that the NSC of all the institutions within the White House, uh, Executive Office of the President, is the least political um, because good foreign policy is typically good politics. Yeah. And, um, but... Any administration, I would I would estimate that roughly eighty percent of any National Security Council staff is people that are detailed from the military or the State Department or other mm -hmm. agencies, uh, and so that was how I ended up there. But I spent four years of my life working at the uh, working at the NSC. Very interesting, and you know it's unfortunate that politics these days are just so polarizing. You know the fact that you just said you worked for President Bush and President Trump triggered people listening and watching like i know that and it shouldn't trigger you like if you don't like these presidents or even if it's whatever it is like it's not even about that um it's just so such a sensitive topic these days and i even hesitated to even ask you that but i, I think it's important to be, have part of this conversation to just share that but it's just unfortunate that it's so polarizing and triggering these yeah. days it's a sad it's a sad state of affairs it's a sad state and i i shared this the other night because we had some friends come into town um on their boat and uh, we went over for a uh, happy hour. And so as we were talking, this older gentleman was asking me about that. 
And I said, you know, the only people you typically hear about at the White House are like maybe three or four or five or six characters. Um, but there are about 5,000 people that work there. And they come to work dressed out and ready to play every day. And like yeah. me, they come to work like putting America's interests first to go, my job is to keep the country safe. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I, I jokingly, I use this line a couple times when I speak, when people find out that I was a Homeland Security advisor, they many times ask me uh, how I slept at night. Yeah. And I like to say like a baby. I wake up every three hours, <laughs> I cry and I go right back to sleep. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's, no, it's, it's, we're in, we're in much better hands, uh, you know, I think with, with the national security professionals that are serving us. Um, but it's a dangerous world out there. It as, is, as especially with what's happening right now, which we won't get into. But I have a question for you that I never actually asked you before, so I might as well ask it to you here on camera. Um, when I lecture, I mean, you see me lecture. You've heard some of my talks on my podcast. I'm very against the government in terms of nutrition, right? I like, I go at them and, and, and don't get me wrong. I respect the government and I'm so grateful for people like you. And I, I'm so grateful to live in a free country. And I'm so blessed to live here. But when it comes to nutrition, it's just God awful. It is, yeah. it is disgusting. It is the exact, it's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. So my question to you is, uh, does that bother you at all that I go at the government that way? Number one, number two, why are the policies so disgusting and it's getting worse? Yeah. Uh, so question number one, I don't mind you asking me that. It's, um, I mean, it's one of the beautiful things about our country. It's freedom of speech, right? You, sh you should be able to speak out when you, when you dislike something that, uh, that we're wrestling with. I don't know how we got so wrongheaded on understanding nutrition uh, and prescribing nutritional guidance as a matter of public health. Um, but I think the science is becoming increasingly clear that we've gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's a shame to me, uh, to you as, as well. I know you and I have talked about this before, that you know medical costs are just rising and rising and rising. And we have a fairly deep understanding of why that's happening. right? It's standard American diet. It's high fructose corn syrup, it's processed foods, it's all these other things uh, that people are unwittingly, and I unwittingly for many years uh, was a consumer of. But uh, I, don't, I don't shop in the interior aisles of the grocery store anymore. I shop around the perimeter where all the fresh fruits and vegetables are and, and the meats and those sorts of things. Um, and I think in, in a way... You know, and I, I say this um, with some sensitivity because my father-in-law is a farmer and, um, and he's suffering from Parkinson's disease in his mid-80s. And he's been handling herbicides, pesticides, glyphosate for decades. And um, we, we need to be able to figure out how to get away from these things that we've adopted in the name of productivity. Yeah. Right? Uh, it's clear that the world's going to need more food production. I mean, like we got to figure that out. Right. But, uh, but we can't poison everybody doing it. Um, and, and I think, I think that's the challenge because that at its core, what was wrong with me when I hit the wall four years ago, um, was met metabolic dysfunction. And it was mostly from the stuff I was putting in my mouth. Right. And then some of it was environmental toxins around it. Right. But it's all about toxicity. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, I don't know. You've got some. You've got some vocal uh, folks um, on this topic, but the industry is is surrounded by industry interests, profitability of pharmaceutical companies, profitability of the the food companies, uh, the very strong lobbies that they have in Washington D.C. Um, I, we need some sort of a tectonic shift because we are absolutely positively moving in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, and we haven't even talked about seed oils, you know, which right, is, I, exactly. I know another one of your, another one of your favorites, but yeah. you know, um, the seed oil production and, and the, and the rise of obesity, maybe not causally linked from a scientific perspective, but they're certainly correl correlatively yeah. linked. Uh, the consumption of all those oils has been going up like this over the last hand. decades and uh, obesity is going up the same direction. Correct. And so I, I think it continues to be voices like yours and, and others in the community that um, 
that will hopefully bring us to a better place. Yeah. And I, I don't, you know, I, I struggle with this a little bit and I did, um, in the wake of the pandemic, you know, there's a place for public health. It's a very important thing for countries to be able to do this and, and, uh, to be able to do that responsibly and, uh, and have all these linkages. But once you understand what the problem is and you have millions of clinical data points, yeah, I think you have to step back from the position that you had originally taken with public health and go, is that, is that the right solution? Right. And, um, you know, knock on wood, by the grace of God, however you want to characterize it, I, you know, I haven't had COVID. I was traveling all over the place during the, during the pandemic uh, with my job. And so um, I don't know what would have happened to me had I gotten it when I was metabolically unhealthy. Yeah. But the best thing that we can do in order to be healthy for the next pandemic, if there is one, God forbid, uh, is to be metabolically flexible. That's right. right? That's what the conversation should have been about last three years and to this day. And it's hard because most Americans want a pill. Yeah, exactly. A pill for every ill. Exactly. They they don't want to do the work. And now they're coming after keto. I mean, I I texted you and we'll talk a little bit later about this, but you know, what happened with Dr. Berg's YouTube channel and him reaching out to me about him getting, you know, 75% less of the exposure he was getting and the there is a uh, this is not a conspiracy. There is actually a concrete agenda to have uh, by 2030 to have the entire population eating plant based food, uh, mostly engineered plant based food. So obviously keto is against is the opposite. So what do you do? You go to the YouTube, which is YouTube is now regulating keto content and not allowing uh, content creators like me, Dr. Berg, and others to rank like we used to rank. And when you look up keto diet on YouTube now, what do you see? The first few videos are videos about, with doctors bashing keto. Mayo Clinic saying it's dangerous for you, saying you got to be worried about ketoacidosis. So there's a, there's some resistance, but I, al- I also believe that good will prevail, God will prevail. Um, it's, it's what we're dealing with. The resistance is strong, but conversations like this, the people in yeah. our field are much stronger. Well, and I think, I, I think to try to keep it as emotionless as possible, and, the, and just a fact-based, empirically sound. Correct. Like, this is what works. And, and there's enough data to do that, too. Yeah. Unfortunately, most scientific and medical studies are only funded if there's some profitability on right. the other end of it. Yeah. As a, as, and maybe that's where the federal government could do a better job of, uh, you know, creating more grants to conduct studies on things that aren't necessarily profitable. Absolutely. Right? But that are... That are one healthier and will reduce two will reduce our our medical costs over time, which in turn is profitable. <clears throat> you're not spending so much money on it. Profitable for some. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yes. You're right. Yeah. Yes. You're right. Um, this has been amazing, Doug. I have a you know my final question. <laughs> hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, You don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's going to cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60-minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audio book. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp 
And if you use the coupon code KETOCAMP at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually, any of their products are 15% off with that code. Bond Charge hooked you up. So head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your Bond Charge products. All right, let's get back to today's video. The final question is about, you already expressed it earlier, gratitude and vitamin G, but what else do you have just exceptional gratitude for right now? Yeah, I, um, so I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ and uh, I'm so grateful that uh, my Lord and Savior died on the cross for me and for you mm -hmm. uh, and for everybody listening. And so um, I could never express my deep gratitude uh, for my heavenly father. Um, but this community of people that are solving these problems, taking these problems into your own hands um, and giving people hope and a pathway, maybe my story rhymes with yours, but there's a way, there's a pathway. It's, it's fairly clear. Uh, there are some things that we continue to wrestle with. You and I have gone back and forth on things like fish oil and vitamin C. And uh, there, there are some things that are not yet reconciled. However, right, we're moving in the right direction. And I think we stay engaged in a constructive and, you know, meaningful conversation about all these important topics. Um, because there's, there's hope, there's health, there's healing, uh, there's strength. Um, and it's a fantastic community to be a part of. So yeah. I'm grateful for all of that. It's beautiful. Uh, well said. What you shared about your faith. Every morning I read uh, a book called Jesus Calling. Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with it. Yeah, and this morning there was a passage that I took a screenshot because it's just so relevant with you know what's happening in the world. If, if you watch the news, the world is coming to an end. But this, this is the quote here, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Yeah. Like we need that faith and that positivity. You just and, expressed it. And I don't know how many times it's been said in the Bible. Uh, you can go look it up in your own Bible. But uh, how many times did Jesus tell his followers to fear not? How many times? A lot. <laughs> a lot. I don't That's know that number off the top of my yeah, head. I probably but that, should. The point is fear not. Fear not. And fear you know, not. there's a lot of talk about like anti this country or anti war. I don't like that anti I think it should be pro peace and pro love and, and pro like, instead of focus on anti this, we should shift our energy into pro the peace and love and the, the kind of lifestyle we want. Yeah. Yeah. And but but if, if, if you're an adherent to Christianity, the, the word is abundantly clear. We are sinners and the world is full of them. Mm -hmm. And so the only salvation that we have is through Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't make you perfect. But, you know, if, if, if you believe um, what he says, what has been recorded, I, you know, and I, I said this during my retirement speech uh, a year or so ago. I there's, watched online. Beautiful speech. Thank you. There's only one person in the recorded history of the world that predicted his death. He predicted his resurrection. And then he did it. And you should just let that settle in a little bit. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if, if, if there's only one person in the world that's ever done that, then um, I'd pretty much go with whatever he says. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You know, even his little brother. Uh, ended up following him and, and ended up being martyred for him. Uh, did not believe his brother was the Christ while he was alive. Mm -hmm. But after he saw him killed and after he saw his resurrected body and after he interacted with him, uh, believed that his brother was the son of God. That's powerful because I've got a brother and let me tell you, <laughs> I could never believe that he was, <laughs> he was, the, son, he was the son of God. So uh, That's beautiful. That's powerful. Uh, where is there anywhere... There's nothing for Doug to sell or any, any books or anything like that, but is there any social media or anything to share or to no, follow you? No, okay. No, I, uh, I've, I've got some minimal digital exhaust <laughs> okay. out there, but um, I, I, I would at some point. I'm, I started to write a book to, about my story. I didn't know that. Um, That's and, exciting. And I'm only, I don't know, maybe 50 pages in. But uh, Beautiful. Maybe if I get fired up to finish that, then, uh, then then you could read the story as well. Yeah, I will. And we'll bring you back and then we'll have somewhere to send somebody. <laughs> yeah. 
Doug, I am grateful for you, man. Uh, grateful that uh, grateful for Mindy because she was the one who yes. allowed this. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Mindy. We love you. Mindy's YouTube channel, which is amazing, Dr. Mindy Pels, everybody go subscribe to it, was the, the catalyst for us meeting and discovering each other. And now, you know, you're friends with Dr. John and Dr. Pampa. And um, you're, you're an amazing human being. And I appreciate you. you. Like, you're so committed to sharing the message and helping people that Doug flew here, you know, to Miami just to record this and, and help you all and share his, his story. And you're flying right back tomorrow. But before that, we're going to go get some steaks. We're going to have a good time. Yeah. And dude, I appreciate you. Uh, I love you. And thank you so much for coming here. That's a two-way street, Ben. Thank you so much. Thank you, bro. Thanks for having me. Yes.